דרכו של אדם ייחשב באושר כוח גיל, כמה הסתכל, כמה נידר. With Rusty Lake, we see the parallels between Moses and Jacob, Yochaved and Caroline, the Pharaoh and Nicholas, and even Moses' siblings with Jacob's own siblings, but more importantly, the lake and God. The lake is God in the island, not the form that the Abrahamic God takes, but its own deity. Don't get me wrong, the Alanders seem heavily influenced by Christianity, specifically with their church. And with their day of the lake being an almost word for word copy of a biblical passage, but they're fully worshiping the lake. This lake religion has its own beliefs, form of worship, and followers. No religious texts or oral tradition, it seems, but cults in fiction are usually fast and loose anyway. Water and fire are important elements in paradise, though they take on different forms from the story that inspired this game. The fire, which becomes Moses' salvation, is both a death sentence and a path to transcendence for Jacob. He is reborn as owl as Moses is reborn from a shepherd into a prophet. Fire is usually seen as a transformative force, so the connections are used in both stories, but done differently. Following this thread of elemental symbolism, water plays a big part in both stories too. The Red Sea and the River Nile were both paths of salvation to Moses, as Rusty Lake is to Jacob. Caroline used a boat to save his life, the lake bled and sent the plagues, and the lake granted him powers in return for the memories he sacrificed. We know that the lake can be dangerous. Take for instance the corrupted soul that attacked Laura during her fishing trip in a previous game. But why didn't it stop Jacob when he tried to leave? Can it even do that? What are its parameters? It might be that the lake wants a specific set of people with specific events occurring because of them. But to be part of the lake's cult, you have to earn your worthiness as well. What I mean is, this is all a test but one where the lake benefits no matter what. If Jacob failed, he would have been sacrificed and Nicholas's leadership would have continued. If Jacob had risen to the challenge, he would have instead supplanted Nicholas and become Mr. Owl. 
and then give the lake his human sacrifices. After all, Jacob does mean supplanter in Hebrew. There's the theory of purely inescapable fates in fan spaces. Some fans think that the lake and its followers choose certain people because it was always meant to happen. Admittedly, I used to like this theory, but I don't buy into it anymore. Besides the theory I just gave you, this is also because RL gives you alternate Laura and Dale endings where you can escape. I think if they did want their fates to be truly inescapable, these additions weaken that theme severely. But I don't claim to know the intentions of the devs. I think it's the same way a river branches off into different channels. Rusty Lake has different possible futures. However, it is ensured that the lake wins by the end, no matter what the outcome. While the lake appears stationary, it holds enough power over time and over people to account for that. There's a lot of fun trivia in the game, but I'll focus on the ones tied to our discussion. We know that Rusty Lake uses physical paintings for their games. They're usually made by Rusty Lake's own Johann Schrift or made by older, established European artists. This painting of Salome by Jacob van Ustanen is what Caroline's design is based on. It also appears in Case 23 and Paradise. Salome is a highly sexualized femme fatale in pop culture, but it's actually pretty inaccurate to what she was like in religious texts. There were no seven veils, and she never stripped for her stepfather. Think of her more like a vengeful daughter defending her mother's honor through dancing and murder. It was basically like when people mistook Elijah Wood for Daniel Radcliffe, but imagine if someone put a hit on Daniel Radcliffe. Case 23 also used the Massacre of Innocents by Lodovico Mazzolino and the Adoration of the Shepherds by Ramantino. The Massacre of Innocents depicts the killing of baby boys from Bethlehem. This was enacted by King Herod who hoped to kill the infant Jesus through a mass killing. Jesus Christ. The Adoration of the Shepherds is supposed to be an artistic interpretation of Jesus Christ receiving presents after being born. If I should stay Jesus is the messiah of the Christian religion and a prophet in Islam, but he's not Christian or Muslim himself, he's Jewish. Keep in mind that he does not exist in Judaism. You know with the relatives I had in the schools I went to, I was surrounded by Catholicism. So I only found out in recent years that Protestants can't depict religious figures for idolatry reasons. Which is understandable. I wonder if there's any correlation with me having to see holy figures being bludgeoned and tied up and stripped naked for most of my life. And my ability to enjoy Hellraiser. And I really do mean enjoy Hellraiser. Speaking of enjoying things, liking and subscribing would be a big help to me in knowing if people want more of these kinds of videos. I do like talk- What the fuck was that? Consider commissioning me on Kofi if you ever want flowers or blood or- Skulls for your videos. Or icons. Honestly, anything. I'm desperate. So all in all, you get what I mean, right? Intentionally and unintentionally, the Alander family seems to be like a messed up version of all these stories. Caroline was protecting her son from a cult leader whom she married, and Jacob came back from exile only to be turned into an antagonistic force by... Well, we don't really know yet. What is the lake? It's some sort of god, but we don't know why it does what it does. Al certainly talks like it has desires, and it does give them power when they sacrifice to it. But if it does love its followers, it doesn't love in the way that most people would want their object of worship to take care of them. It's more like a cultivated, dangerous, mutualistic relationship between itself and its followers, with Nicholas as the original mediator. I do wonder about that fake painter written on the Salome painting, and if that's a sort of hint. You know the one, Lake Asfleo. It's been speculated by fans to be a reference to Lake Flevo, since this is a Dutch game and it was a Dutch lake. Furthermore, Lacus is Latin for lake while both Fleo and Flevo both mean flow or to grieve. It's not just that they sound the same. 
Lake Flevo was a freshwater inland lake located in the Netherlands. It was connected to the North Sea through tidal inlets. Flevo was named by the Roman geographer Pomponius Mela in his book Decorographia. He wrote it sometime in 43 or 44 AD. Flevo used to be peatland pond water before it became a lake in Roman times and the early Middle Ages. It happened through a connecting path to the Vaden Sea. After the catastrophic St. Lucia's flood in 1287, the lake flooded, absorbed the Lake Vli, and submerged the medieval peatlands that had been eroding around it. It eventually grew into the salty Zodersee Bay, thanks to the North Sea spilling through. Zodersee would separate West Friesland from the contemporary province of Friesland. It would also sink several peatlands, islands, and even cities like Stavoren underwater. Some were saved after the flood, some remained beneath the bay, and some were nearly washed away over time like Shockland. After a very long series of reclamation projects which created dams, water drainages, and... For my English-speaking subscribers, I don't know if I can reclaim this word. In the end, Sodder Sea was turned into the freshwater lake, Isomere, and several lands that were previously submerged were resurfaced or restored like Shockland in the 1940s. A lot of late medieval objects were found as a result of the reclamation project, and even shipwrecks were discovered. During the reclamation projects, there was also the creation of new land, known as polders. In the research PDFs, wiki pages, and the tourism websites talking about the bay, taming is used a lot and it's framed like a long-time battle between man and the forces of nature. Understandable given that Zodersy, as it was, was very unstable from the 17th century onwards. Rusty Lake Island itself is based on Lake Bled in Slovenia. The devs admitted as much and you can see the similarities. Lake Flevo has more significance in northern Netherlands, but Rusty Lake takes inspiration from different countries. So we might consider it its own place existing outside our world. People are able to travel there, either unconscious like Dale or awake like Jacob. But it's not concretely taking place in the Netherlands, or maybe even in our own normal flow of time. Rose does tell us that the future and past blend together there. In the White Door ARG, Rusty Lake is even written like it's its own country, definitely leaning into the fact it is outside of time and space. If Bob was from the Netherlands, his code would end with an L, since codes like UK for United Kingdom and SK for South Korea have been used. But his ends with RL, meaning Rusty Lake. So the lake is shown to be deceptively deep with an ecosystem that seems abnormal to me. The fish with human legs is the least of our problems. It contains corrupted souls of the Elander family members, um, you know, Nicholas, Elizabeth, David, Margaret, and Gerard in its forest. There's also an extraction facility managed by Crow, an elevator system, and Rose's soul which has been turned into a tree. Besides the fact that Rusty Lake seems to be in its own plane of existence, fashioned after Naraka into real paintings, Lake Flevo has existed for centuries. What's going on there is beyond our comprehension and is just bleeding into our world. Usually I'd say that this is a metaphorical and fanciful storytelling that follows folktale-like logic more than concrete ones. And maybe this is just how the universe of Rusty Lake is. However, Bob's perspective in the white door shows us that you know, this is just very abnormal for their world. Okay, so hear me out. What if Rusty Lake is what remains of Lake Flevo? A continuing echo in this game. Somehow, it's become a living entity. You've seen several accomplices to steal your memories and change you the same way it was changed. Forget who you are the same way it's forgotten itself. I'm not sure if the lake is sentient in the way people are, but Owl once said that the lake will be pleased. And that implies it can feel emotions. As we know, with delight comes anger. The plagues only come because of a transgression committed. The lake doesn't really seem like it's something that can move on its own, but rather enacts punishments and blessings to anyone nearby. It did so in paradise and the lake. I mean the lake, the game. The, the, looking through the dialogue in the games, it only speaks through its wants using whoever's pulling the strings, but it never speaks directly. 
Case in point, case 23. It turns back time in the cabin to revive Dale, and Dale becomes aware that it's the will of the lake forcing him to come back, but that's it. It doesn't talk, it just lets people know what it's doing. The same way a flame doesn't tell you it's hurting you, you just know. While well, revenge is always a fun motive, an alternative theory is that it's just a hungry entity that wants memories. Not out of malice, but because it needs it to survive. And if both past and future live in the lake, and time doesn't exist in it, that means that the lake can see the branching paths of timelines that could be, always will be, or never should be. It feeds on, it past, feeds on past information, but it's a monster made from various inevitabilities. Inevitability. Inevitabil- it's hard to say where this is going now that the games did a hard pivot into sci-fi or something like that. And we might not return to this mythical plot point for six more years? Who knows? But who knows? Who knows? Okay, this part has more spoilers for the rest of the story, so click out if you haven't played Roots and etc. As of 2024, Paradise still includes the first reincarnation ritual in RL's timeline. And two centuries later, a woman named Rose would use a different ritual in Rusty Lake Roots that yields similar results. Despite never meeting him, she helps her great-granduncle William reincarnate through timepieces and harvested body parts. She does do a bit of balancing, but it's not until 1971 that we get a ritual that really resembles Caroline's. In Cube Escape Seasons, Laura balances four substances of her past life to revive herself. This follows the same procedure as Paradise's ritual, except Caroline balances ten. She seems to be doing this alone, but I wonder if a human sacrifice is actually truly necessary for reversing a hungry ghost's corruption and receiving enlightenment the same way the elixir needs someone to die for someone else to be immortal. After all, when William was reincarnated and Laura was born, both her uncles were sacrificed. When Albert was revived, Rose gives her life and becomes a tree under the lake. And going back to the A-landers, enlightenment was promised to them if they sacrificed Jacob and Caroline was reincarnated after Jacob died. Was someone else with our first protagonist in Cube Escape Seasons that she had to sacrifice? Someone we didn't yet know about when the very first game was released? Or was there someone who had to sacrifice her? Next time I'll be talking about Rusty Lake's use of Arthurian legends, the rules of the rituals, and the musical that inspired this game. I'll see you until then.